Okay, so let's finish up this look at phylogenetics. Uh, the material on this recording will definitely be on the homework for this week and of course on the exam. So we're look, we've been looking at issues of phylogenetics, that is reconstructing the family tree of life. And now let's take a look at something having to do with names on the tree of life. Now remember that in a cladogram, in a phylogenetic tree, the relationships and the groupings shown are based on patterns of recency of common ancestry and not on overall similarity. So for instance, on this cladogram uh, we see here, we can see that crocodilians, like an alligator, are closer to a duck, that is share a more recent common ancestor with a duck, than they do with a lizard, even though grossly speaking, a lizard and a crocodile look more similar to each other than a crocodile and a bird does. Now, in order to get to understanding that, let's think about the names on the cladogram. So we've seen taxon names at the tips before. So the terminal taxa, or the tips, those are the taxa that we put into the analysis to begin with. You recognize them already. We are comparing their interrelationships. But there are also the nodes, the connections between branches. And those are also nameable. They're also groups. And these are the groups that are revealed through the analytical results. And they can have names too. And indeed, they often have names as well. Now, how do you read these relationships? Well, it's worth noting that the name at a node includes the entire part of the tree that comes from that node. So actually, let me back up here. So sauropsida here refers to this entire branch, the one that includes testudines and lepidosauria and crocodilia and eoraptor and aves. And amniota refers to all this stuff that, that is sauropsida plus this other branch, synapsida. So let's take a look at this subdivision of the sauropsids here, the traditional reptiles, although you'll see there's a member of this group which is not traditionally thought of as being reptiles, um, and, and see how to re read this tree. By the way, I should point out one of the relationships here, that is the position of testudines, is in a bit of flux in paleontology and biology in general. I'm showing you sort of the traditional position. But to be fair, there are some analyses that have it come out over here that are not super crazy. Um, OK, so let's take a look at this. On this diagram, we could try to find out what the closest relative to aves, to birds, is. And the way you do that is you start at whatever taxon you're interested in. In this case, it's one of the terminal taxa, it's aves. And we go down the tree, that is down towards the base of life. And at the first node we encounter, whatever comes out of that node, all of it is collectively the closest relative to the group we're interested in. Because that means we've gone down to this first branch point below whatever taxon we're looking at. So whatever else comes out of this diagram, out of that, out of that node, collectively that's all the closest relative to this thing. So the closest relative to birds on this tree is crocodilia. So what's the closest relative to crocodilia? We go from this node down, or from this, this tip down to the first node we encounter, which is this node, and whatever else comes out of that node is its closest relative, and that's aves. So this interrelationship is called a sister group, Schwestergruppen in the original German, because remember Willy Hennig was a German, but sister group, Grupos Hermanos in Spanish, closest relatives. Now notice close here doesn't mean looks most similar to. It means shares a more recent common ancestor with. So the concestor of crocodilia and aves is indeed the concestor of both. They both came out of that ancestor. They're each other's closest relatives. So what would be the sister group? Oh, I should back up. So why isn't Archosauria the sister group? That's because Archosauria isn't the name of a tip here. It's the name of the whole clade. It's the name of all the descendants of the concestor 
of Crocodilia and Aves. Crocodilia is part of Archosauria. Aves is part of Archosauria. They're not sister groups. They're members of Archosauria. So what's the sister group to the Rhynchocephalia? That's the Tuataras, a group of uh, a few species limited to New Zealand today, although they were much more common in the geologic past. Well, we do the same thing. We start with Rhynchocephalia. We go down to the first node we encounter. That node has a name. It's called Lepidosauria, but that's not the sister group. The sister group is whatever else comes out of that node, and that's Squamata. Squamates are lizards and snakes. And then what's the sister group to Squamata? Well, it's Rhynchocephalia. Sister group relationships are always complementary. Now, what is the sister group to Lepidosauria? So Lepidosauria is this node. It's the group of Rhynchocephalia plus squamates. We go from this node, Lepidosauria, we go down. The first node we encounter is Sauria. So that's the name of the whole group. So that's not going to be the sister group. What is the other group of Sauria? What else branches from this? Archosauria. As a group, all members of Archosauria are the sister group to all members of Lepidosauria as a group, and vice versa. It's not that crocs are closer to squamates or that birds are closer to rhynchocephalians. No. All archosaurs, birds and crocs and their extinct relatives, are equally closely related to all squamates and tuataras. Hopefully that made sense. So what is the sister group to testudines? Well, as I mentioned, that's actually one of the most contentious uh, questions in sauropsid systematics right now. But given this cladogram, the sister group to testudines is all of Soria. All of Soria. And vice versa, this living sister group to Soria would be testudines. Or let's take a dinosaurian example. Looking at this diagram, look at the cladogram here, what is the sister group to this group, Euhelopodidae? Well, let's go through these. Um, we start from Euhelopodidae, we go down to the first node we encounter. Now the name of that node is Sampospondyli, but that's not going to be the sister group because Euhelopodids are part of Sampospondyli. In fact, the group that comes out of this, the other branch that comes out of here is Titanosauria. So hopefully that made sense. Now, there's a special thing about names on the cladogram. And indeed, this is one of the big shifts in taxonomy due to cladistics. And that is to use only monophyletic groups. So monophyletic, single branch. So a name on a cladogram is an ancestor and all of its descendants. A synonym for a monophyletic group is a clade. That's from the Greek word klados, or stem, or branch. So we're looking cladistics in modern taxonomy we use only monophyletic groups so an ancestor and all of its descendants synapsida as a group is monophyletic it's an ancestor and all descendants mammals and dimetrodon here sauropsida is a monophyletic group it's the group that includes testudines and lepidosauria and crocodilia and eoraptor and aves or we could say it includes Dinosauria, Crocodilia, Lepidosauria, and Testudines. Or we could say it's Archosauria and Lepidosauria and Testudines. Or we could say it's Sauria and Testudines. All the same thing here. Now, because of this, because of the shift to only thinking about monophyletic groups, or only using monophyletic groups, many traditional groupings in older Linnaean systematics turn out to be what we call paraphyletic. That is, an ancestor, but not all of its descendants. Paraphyletic groupings are sometimes called grades because they share, they share a common grade or level of organization. But they don't represent a complete branch of the tree of life, and they may be positively misleading. In cladistics, we prefer grades, so clades, to grades. So remember this figure from the lecture I gave on Monday. We saw the three living quote unquote classes in the Linnaean taxonomy of living vertebrates Mammalia, Reptilia, and Aves collectively forming the terrestrial vertebrates. And then within Reptilia, three groups Testudines, Lepidosauria, and Crocodilia in the living world. Well, I mentioned before that the Linnaean system didn't tell us which ones were more closely related 
to which other ones? But cladistics does. So we map these forms onto a cladogram. And now we see that crocodiles and birds are sister taxa, that lepidosaurs are a sister taxon to the crocodile bird clade, that testudines are a sister taxon to the lepidosaur plus croc plus bird clade, and that mammalia is a sister group to all of them. And these are supported by various derived features, shared derived features. In fact, they're supported by hundreds of them. I'm just showing a super simplified version. So in cladistics, we prefer, prefer names to be clades, an incomplete branch of the tree of life. So an ancestor and all of its descendants. So mammals and testudines and lepidosauria and crocs and birds are amniota. All these things other than mammalia form the clade sauropsida. Lepidosaurs, crocs, and birds are in the clade sauria. And crocs and birds are in the clade archosauria. And it doesn't matter that birds are highly transformed compared to crocs or lizards. They're still members of archosauria and sauria and sauropsida and amniota. So paraphyletic groupings were put together on the basis basically of shared primitive features. Now they would sometimes have some shared derived features, but they would also exclude things like the traditional grouping of reptilia excluded birds, it excluded mammals, it included the early branches of synapsida that lacked mammalian traits. And so this is a paraphyletic grouping. It includes an ancestor. It includes the common ancestor of all amniotes. But it excluded, in this case, two groups. It excluded birds and it excluded mammals. The thing is, this is actually misleading because it turns out things like crocodiles and eoraptor and so forth have traits that are shared with birds that are not present or weren't present in Dimetrodon. And Dimetrodon had traits which are shared with mammals that weren't shared with these forms over here. Another aspect of paraphyletic groupings, and if you've needed another reason to, um, um, to recognize that they're not natural groupings, is where do you draw the line? Now already we have to make an arbitrary decision as to the base of a group. It's often based on something about you know, the history of our use of that word. But where do, you, where do they stop being something? So for instance, if you look at the living vertebrates, you know, we've got things like turtles and we've got crocs and they're roughly similar. They're scaly and cold blooded and so forth. So it made sense to call these reptiles. Birds are highly different. And so it was easy to separate the two. But what happens when we add in extinct forms? We have creatures which are feathered, which were flying, but had teeth and long uh, bony tails. We have creatures that were not flying, but had feathers. They were also bipedal, like birds and so forth, unlike crocs, unlike birds, uh, unlike turtles. And we had four early forms that probably didn't have feathers, but were upright, walked on their hind legs, were probably warm blooded. Where did they stop being reptiles and start being birds? Was it with toothless beaks? Was it with powered flight? Was it with the presence of feathers? Was it warm bloodedness and upright stance? Well, that's the thing. In cladistics, you never stop being a member of a group. You just start being a member of a subgroup as well. So now we see reptilia, or rather we generally prefer sauropsida down here and that Aves is part of that group. And indeed, by making sure that all our groups are monophyletic, an ancestor and all of its descendants, we can actually have phylogenetic definitions for names. So a definition is a statement, in this case a statement of relationships. So I'm not talking about the etymology of the name, where the word, where the root elements come from. And I'm not talking about the diagnosis of the group, the features that we would use to recognizing it, recognize it. I'm saying we can create a formula that specifies what this group represents on the tree of life. And then we can test whether a particular individual taxon belongs to that group or not based on their phylogenetic relationships. So here's an example, or a set of, of examples, of phylogenetic taxon names. Ones that you're going to get pretty darn used to. So Theropoda, 
is a group defined as Megalosaurus, and all taxa sharing a more recent common ancestor with Megalosaurus, that is this form, than with Iguanodon or Diplodocus. So on this cladogram, this green triangle represents everything that would be in Theropoda. So any branches down here, any branches over here, any branches over here are theropods. And so this winds up including crows and ravens. Then we have Ornithischia. And this is the group defined as Iguanodon and all taxa sharing a concestor with Iguanodon not shared with Megalosaurus or Cediosaurus or, or Diplodocus. And that would be this blue wedge here. And I think you can see where I'm going here. The third group is Sauropodomorpha, and that's going to be Diplodocus, and everything closer to Dippy than to Meg or Ig, just for shorthand. That's that wedge. And now, what is a dinosaur? Dinosauria, the clade Dinosauria, is defined as the concestor of Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, Diplodocus, and all of its descendants. So it's this red wedge. So on this cladogram, Silosaurus is not a dinosaur because it branched off this phylogeny prior to the divergence between the lineage containing Megalosaurus, that is Theropoda, the lineage containing Diplodocus, that's Sauropodomorpha, and the lineage containing Iguanodon, Ornithischia, before those three diverged from each other. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, let's think about the transformations, because sometimes we're not just interested in groups or names, but the evolutionary transformations that would have occurred in the history of that lineage. Now, it's important to note that none of the terminal taxa, none of the forms at the tips, are likely to represent the ancestral condition in all of its states. And this is especially true if they're all, say, extant. Extant is the opposite of extinct. So if they're all still alive, we wouldn't expect any of these forms to have the traits that were in the ancestral versions. We use outgroups as a way of inferring them, but that's because we're not looking at the specializations in that outgroup, and it, it will almost certainly have some, particularly if we're talking about forms that all live at the same time, like in this case at the present. Each of the terminal taxa may have their own specializations on their branch that have evolved since their divergence from the concestor. So for instance, a duckbill platypus may be the earliest branching of these three forms here, but it has its own specializations like electrical sensitivity and poison, uh, uh, poison in its feet and uh, it's semi-aquatic, and many of those traits, maybe not all of them, many of those traits were unlikely to be present down here, and in fact evolved after the lineage that contains a platypus split from the lineage containing other mammals. However, if we're interested in the origin, say, of humans, by the way, that's Sir Richard Owen, uh, and these are tree shrews, if we're interested in the origin of humans, we would be interested in the transformations that occur along the quote-unquote trunk towards that form. And that would tell us something about the transformations relative to the origin of humans. So again, what I stated before, the tips do not give us the information directly about what the transformations were. They're going to be used to infer what the transformations would be along the cladogram at the internal nodes. Now, a couple more aspects to cover here, but we're almost done. Cladograms can help us predict the status of missing information. At least it can sometimes. At least it can sometimes. And we're going to rely on parsimony again. Remember parsimony, the idea that all other things being equal, we assume the fewest number of changes, in this case is the fewest number of evolutionary changes, to get to what we actually see. Now, sometimes we're not going to be able to resolve these questions, but sometimes we can. So, for instance, in my beloved tyrannosaurs, the derived tyrannosaurs have only two fingers. They've lost, they had a lot, many carnivorous dinosaurs, as we'll see, had already lost digit five and digit four. So they were down to three fingers. And then in forms like Gorgosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, they're down to two. They retain digit one, the thumb, and digit two, the pointer finger. 
Now there are some tyrannosaurs for which we don't have the hand preserved as fossils. There's things like Oliaramus and Dryptosaurus. Now based on the other parts of the skeleton, we can infer this relationship pattern here. Now on this cladogram, the simplest explanation for the loss of finger of finger three, so manual digit three, is after the divergence of DeLong from the concestor, or from after the divergence of the lineage that contains DeLong, from the lineage that contains the concestor of Gorgosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. But prior to the divergence of the lineage containing Gorgosaurus and the lineage containing Tyrannosaurus. So that would be in generally this part of the cladogram. Now based on this information, if this is correct, then we can infer that Oliaramus would have only two fingers. Could we be wrong? Darn tootin' we could. But we would need positive information. That is, we would need, for instance, the hand of Oliaramus to demonstrate that we're wrong. The simplest explanation, the explanation that requires no additional assumptions, is that it retained the loss of finger three. So all of the things being equal, we assume it only had two fingers. But what about Dryptosaurus? Notice that it branches off of this cladogram in the same general part of the tree as the loss of finger three. Did it branch off after the loss of finger three, in which case it goes down to two fingers, or prior to the loss of finger three, in which case it retains three fingers? And at present, eh, we don't know. Sometimes we don't know remains the best answer. So sometimes we'll get a solution. And the simplest solution will be, in this case, the loss of finger three and the ancestry of Oliaramus, so it only had two fingers. But sometimes we don't have a good answer. It remains ambiguous. Artists can hate this. Animators can hate this. And a lot of fan, dino fans will hate this. We'll say, well, what do you think Dryptosaurus had? Do you think it had two or do you think it had three? We don't know, and that should be good. That should be good enough for you. Yes, it means that when if you're trying to do a sculpture of it or you're trying to do an animation of it, you're going to have to pick. And you're going to have to go with three or two, and you could be wrong. Just deal with it. You just have to deal with it. That's what happens when we've got a missing information. It's okay to be wrong, but at least you were justified in being wrong. If you put four fingers on, that would be very unjustified. Is it theoretically impossible? No, it could have happened. It could have had reversals and gone back to four fingers. But there's no reason to suspect it. But even using parsimony, we can't tell if Dryptosaurus had a three-fingered hand or a two-fingered hand. It's the reason we still need to dig up bones, among other things. So, we, again, we sometimes get ambiguous results. And it's not just ambiguous results about the distribution of particular traits. Sometimes because of the ambiguity with missing information, or convergence, or reversals, we can get more than one equally most parsimonious tree. So, so far, I've always shown us getting a single good tree out of analysis. But quite frankly, that's rare. Normally, we get multiple equally parsimonious trees. In reality, only one of them could be correct. But given our information at the moment, we can't figure out which one it is. So how do you summarize that information? Well, one of the ways you can do this is to show what's called a consensus tree. So sometimes two or more trees are equally well supported. Here they are, instead of being taxa, they're letters, letters representing the taxon. And we see in the one on the left, B branched off earlier, and then there was a grouping of C plus D plus E. And on the one on the right, C branched off earlier, and then there was a branch, a, gr a group that contained B plus D plus E. And let's say they're equally parsimonious. We can't choose between the two of them. Now we can show a consensus tree, one that shows all the information that's consistent between all the trees. So they all have A as the outgroup. They all have a clade of D plus E that excludes all others. 
And then they have B and C diverging in the same general part of the tree. We call this a polytomy. So dichotomy is a two-way split, polytomy multiple branches coming from the same node. We're not saying here necessarily that that was a concestor that had three branches coming out of it, B and C and D plus E, although that is a theoretical possibility. What we're saying here is we are unresolved at the moment as to the branching order here, but B and C are almost certainly in this part of the tree. So the vast majority of times we actually get results that'll have at least some polytomies in our consensus trees. Now this was simple enough. It was only two alternative trees and you know showing both of them actually wouldn't have been that much of a problem. But what if there's a dozen equally parsimonious trees or 2,000 or 200,000 which sounds like you have no information there but actually if you've got dozens of taxa and you only have 200,000 equally most parsimonious trees that might collapse into a series of polytomies but you still have a lot of structure there. At least you potentially have a lot of structure there. So sometimes in the course we'll be seeing polytomies and that just represents it's unresolved but the origin is somewhere in there. Finally, I mentioned before that cladograms give us the relative branching order in time. But we can actually combine the information from cladograms and the information from stratigraphy to determine the minimum divergence time between two groups. There's actually several techniques people can use to figure out divergence times. One is to infer it based on what we call molecular or divergence clocks. This is extremely uh, more useful in if you have DNA data, which might change on a more regular basis, and you make predictions as to when divergence has occurred. But if we're just going with the raw fossil data, we can still tell what's the last moment in time two lineages could have been one and then diverged. Now the real divergence is going to be earlier than that, almost certainly. The chances of us capturing at the actual moment, like the day after this divergence took place, almost certainly didn't happen. In fact, we probably wouldn't recognize those two groups as separate groups that early. They hadn't acquired recognizable traits. But it gives us at least a minimum. So it tells us those, that divergence had to have occurred by then. So let's see how that works. Let's take this particular set of relationships. I'm not saying this is the actual divergence pattern of these groups. In fact, when we get to these groups in the course later on, I'm going to show you a different, a more up-to-date version. But we'll keep it simple now. These are three different groups of beaked dinosaurs. We have a group called Serapoda. We have a group called Descalosauridae. And we have a group called Calindodromius. In this case, one genus, one traditional quote-unquote family, and then actually a huge group that includes a lot of different taxa. So let's say this is their cladogram. Let's move that information over to the side. And now let's map out their ranges through geologic time. Seropoda, the oldest representatives we have are from the Middle Jurassic, and they extend to the end of the Cretaceous. Thescalosauridae, at least the version I'm using here, uh, which would not be the version I would we'll be using when we get to Thescalosaurids later in the course, first show up in the early Cretaceous and extend until the end of the Cretaceous. By the way, so oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top, millions of years ago. And the red line shows us our known range, so where we have fossils of them. And Calindodromius is just a middle Jurassic form. Now given this relationship with Seropoda and Thescalosauridae as sister taxa, they had to have diverged by the Middle Jurassic. Because if Seropoda and Thescalosaurids are sister taxa, that is, Seropods are not the ancestor of Thescalosaurids, but rather they're sister taxa, that means there had to be a shared common ancestor of them prior to them splitting into two groups. And if Seropoda is, pro is present in the Middle Jurassic, then the lineage containing Thescalosauridae has to extend that far down, even though that's tens of millions of years before their first appearance. But remember, the chance of any form showing up in the fossil record is relatively limited. So it's not uncommon to find these what we call ghost lineages, or sections of 
divergence that we infer, but we don't find them. Maybe we have early Thescalosaurid fossils in the collections, but we don't recognize them as such. Or maybe they're in a part of the world we haven't sampled, or something along those lines. So a mini minimum divergence time in the middle Jurassic. And similarly, Calindodromius is outside these two, so the shared common ancestor of Calindodromius and both of these together had to be earlier than the ancestor of Sauropoda and Thescalosauridae. And even though the first so Calindodromius appears a little after the first seropod, the common ancestor of Calindodromius and this clade had to have been even earlier. How much earlier? Eh, we don't know. We'll just still say Middle Jurassic. But earlier than the Sauropoda plus Thescalosaurid group. Okay, with that, we now have the main methods we'll be using for the course. Starting in Friday's lecture, first of all, starting Friday's lecture, that will be information that's covered on the second exam, not the first one. But also, we'll begin to deploy these methods in order to understand the history of dinosaurs. But to get to the history of dinosaurs, we have to get before their origin and see what the world was like uh, that they came into and what they came from. Take care and see you in class.